So this is our eighth session. Um, and we're still in the um, evoking task of the four tasks that I talked about. Um, and remember that there are three sets of skills we have covered, and you'll see them all today. Uh, in session five, we talked about how to recognize change talk so that when you hear it, you know something important is happening. Then in session six, we talked about how to invite change talk so you don't just have to sit and wait for it. Uh, and then in the previous session, session seven, we talked about how to respond when you hear change talk, because that's also quite important. Uh, if you respond well to change talk when you hear it, you, you'll get more change talk. And so you'll see those skills in action today. Uh, remember that we talked about it matters what questions you ask. So that, that determines in part uh, how much change talk you'll hear. Uh, versus how much pushback you get. But it's, MI is not just about asking clever questions. It also matters what you do next once you hear change talk. And it matters what you reflect. We covered uh, that last time in particular. It matters what you affirm. It matters what you put into the summaries that you offer. And all of those things affect the amount of change talk that you will be receiving. But how do you decide? The preference in general is to ask for change talk, to reflect change talk, to affirm change talk, to put the change talk that you hear into summaries. There is a period at the beginning when you're just engaging and you'll be listening to and reflecting whatever the client is offering you. But as your time together goes on, you begin to shift more to differentially focus on change talk. We're going to be looking today at a, a very skillful session of motivational interviewing. It's when we captured this one on video, I was really pleased because it is just one of the most uh, skillful sessions I have ever seen. The interviewer is uh, Professor Terry Moyers, <clears throat> who's now on the psychology faculty here at the University of New Mexico. And originally, we had engaged this client as an actor to portray a particular role uh, so that we could uh, demonstrate one aspect of motivational interviewing. But he had to wait. We were filming someone else. And, and so while he was waiting, he was rather antsy and he kept going outside the smoke. And then he'd come back in and then we still aren't ready, go back outside and, and smoke again. and. So th this back and forth was happening. And Dr. Moyers had the presence of mind to ask him if he'd be willing to just forget about the role that he had prepared and simply talk about his own smoking. And he said, Sir, sure, that's fine. He, he agreed to that. So here he's talking about his own smoking. This is not a, not a role-played uh, interview. And remember, he had not come in to talk about his smoking. Uh, he had an entirely different expectation of what was going to happen, <clears throat> nor was he looking for any help with regard to his smoking. So the, this is the, the beginning of this, uh, of this interview. Now, this interview is also available free, so you can watch it at this, uh, at this particular link. And I'm going to uh, run about 10 minutes of it. Uh, and then we'll spend some time looking carefully at exactly what happened in this interview. Um, you'll, you'll see pretty quickly a lot of change talk occurring, even though this is not someone who came in looking to talk about or get any help with his smoking. And the question is, why is that happening? How, how, how is it occurring that we're hearing so much change talk? Uh, what's Dr. Moyer thinking? with each uh, thing that she says. And remember in motivational interviewing, you're thinking one step ahead. If I say this, what's the client likely to say next? And you're trying to arrange the interview so that you invite the person's own change talk. You invite them to talk about uh, why they might want to change, how they could do it, uh, why it's important and so on. And you'll, you'll see that 
occurring in this interview. Richard, you've agreed to come in today and talk to me a little bit about your smoking. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I was thinking about this when we were, before we were talking about it, that if I were able to sit down right now and have a cigarette, I would, mm -hmm. because I like to smoke. So being in front of the camera makes you feel like you want to have a cigarette. Actually, my whole life is based around a cigarette. Hmm. I mean, I get in my car, I smoke a cigarette. If I'm, of course, in radio or in other fields, you, you can't use usually smoke in your job, so you have to take those breaks. But, mm -hmm. but in the older days, I used to be able to smoke anywhere. So it makes it a little bit tougher. But yeah, if I could have a cigarette right now, I would. It's that uh, much a part of your life that you feel like you would have one even right now. Absolutely, and I think you find yourself going out at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night to go to, to the store to grab a pack of cigarettes when you smoke because it's what you need, physically need it, but you also like it because you enjoy it. Right, there's a, there's a part of you that really enjoys smoking. Right. And then there's a part that says you really don't want to, hmm. or you shouldn't. And it has nothing to do with people saying you can't. It's the fact that after a period of time, you start the flavor, the taste, the problems, the, it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, you really like it, and the, the, it's good for you, helps you. And on the other hand, you're noticing some things you don't like about it. Right. You, like you have to go out at night and get it, you have to look for a break. And then there's also something about the flavor and the taste, you said. Yeah, you just get to a point where it's not enjoyable anymore. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it strictly out of habit, probably because of the nicotine that you want. Uh -huh. But it's really not what you, it's really not because you want it. It's because it gets to a point where you have to have it. Uh, and I've never tried to quit. I mean, I've been smoking for a long time and never once said, you know what, I'm going to quit smoking. And why is that, do you think? I think it's, the, it's it becomes a way, it's so much a part of your life. It becomes a, what you do. It's everything that you are... Um, you go, if you go fishing, you go hunting, you go to sporting events, every, everything you do, that cigarette becomes part of who you are. Huh. Even to a point where you can't imagine yourself looking in the mirror without holding a cigarette. It is part of your, part of who your character is even. So cigarettes are now a part of your character. Absolutely. That becomes part of your character. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've had people tell me they can't even imagine me without a cigarette. Can't imagine what I'd look like without a cigarette. And you can't even imagine yourself without a cigarette. No. So you just, it becomes who you are. But at the same time, you know some things are happening. One is, you know, um, that it, you're, you're, you don't, the taste isn't there anymore. Uh, the cost is getting really, really high. So now you're finding yourself going to these lesser brands or making this run to the res so you can bypass. I mean, you have to do so much to smoke a cigarette and, and to can maintain that, that desire that it gets really ridiculous, quite frankly. Smoking used to be carefree for you, but now it's actually causing you a lot of trouble. It's a challenge now. It's mm -hmm. not just go get a pack of cigarettes. It's now how much do they cost? Which one are the cheaper ones? Did you pick up a card at the reservation because it's so much cheaper with no taxes? Uh, did you burn that hole in your clothes? Oh my God, that shirt had burned a hole. I mean, you start running into more and more issues. Then you start wondering, What's the return of this? I mean, what is the value? Yeah, of this? I was just going to ask you about that because you mentioned earlier sort of you're smoking more and enjoying it less. And not only that, but then here come all of these sort of burdens or costs. That It'd be a coming. terrible smoke commercial. It'd be <laughs> a terrible commercial. It's almost like if you were trying to convince yourself to smoke, you'd have a hard time doing it. It would be like the old saying smoke less and enjoy more, but it's the opposite smoke more and enjoy less. So it would be a terrible, terrible uh, advertising campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just to the point where you finally decide yourself, you know, somewhere along the line, you know in the back of your mind, somewhere in the back of your mind, you're saying, you know, there's going to come a time when I'm going to put these down. You're thinking about it. Absolutely, because of the, because of the involvement, the, huh. the how much its involvement is to smoke. It's too much. And besides the fact that it's even considered socially unfair or socially, whether you want to consider it fair or unfair, uh, unacceptable in so many arenas, People go out of their way to make an example by saying, oh my God, he's smoking. Uh, could you move that away? Over here? People become very rude with it. Yet, at the same time, it's sort of a two-edged sword. You have the one side that says, don't smoke, and then the other side says, keep smoking because we're going to use it for health care. You know, it's sort of a bizarre. So in your mind, you're going, what is this? It, it, the, the smoker looks at this in a whole different way than the non-smoker. Well, it, it sounds like every time you try to think about one side of it, you have to end up thinking about the other side of it. Yeah, it's just a constant, it's a constant, it's a conversation in your mind. Mm -hmm. 
it's not as free as the early days when you went down and got a pack for 25 cents. For God's sake, you could go into a building and, and they would have a cigarette machine. You put a quarter in, didn't matter how old you were, and pull the lever and pull out your cigarette. Mm -hmm. And you smoked and no one thought much of it. I can remember smoking in the theater, smoking on an airplane, smoking in your job, smoking all the time whenever you wanted to. It was just, it's just uh, considered a norm. Right. You didn't used to think about it very much, and now you're thinking about it all the time. Now it becomes an issue because it's not enjoyable in many, many areas of, of the smoking experience. It's not just the smoke, the flavor, it's the social norm, it's the, what it costs you to buy them, what, what's all involved. And then, of course, the issue of health, hmm. which is the older you get, you begin to realize that it's starting to affect you. And every time you go to the doctor, he says, oh, by the way, have you thought about quitting smoking? Uh, you know, you ought to be considering that. So you're constantly having this little, and friends and relatives and people that don't smoke say, you know, I quit 10 years ago. Oh. You might want to consider it. It changed my life, food tastes better. You know, huh. all that good stuff. You're hearing all this positives when you're dealing with all these negatives. Uh, let, let me see if I just can uh, see see what you've just said. One is you're worried about your health. Oh, sure. Because every time you go to the doctor, the doctor says something. Sure. Uh, second of all, you're thinking about the social stigma that people are always just sort of looking down on you because you're a smoker and saying something like, have you thought about smoking? You should stop smoking. Right? Yeah, you have a lot of, a lot of things coming on a negative more than a positive. When you first started, when I first started in the years and years ago, smoking was considered a positive thing, not a negative. You know, I'd rather fight than switch with Territon, enter into the cool country with Salem. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was built around the advertising campaign to make you feel as though it was okay. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, your friends did it. And it was part of that passage of, mm -hmm. you know, from being a child into an adult hole, and a guy would have a cigarette. And if you were really good, you rolled your own, and you were just really macho. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had the Marlboro guy, and all the guys wanted to look like that really yep. pure type person. So, yeah, from that standpoint, you saw the positives. Today you see the negatives and you hear the negatives. You're, you're seeing the negatives. Absolutely. And you've thought about quitting. Yes, it's entered my mind many times in the last year or so. Uh -huh. And what do you think has kept you from trying? Because it sounds like you're thinking hard about quitting and experiencing a lot of negatives. I think there's two things. One is it, it's become such a normal thing for you. Imagine yourself not having one, getting in the car, because everything you do is circled around that. Uh -huh. So you get in the car and you smoke a cigarette. Um, then you, uh, you light up as soon as you get in the car, as soon as you walk out of a building, as soon as you get out of your office, as soon as you finish with a client, and as soon as you finish eating dinner. I so mean, is it kind of like this, like you just can't even imagine what it would be like not to have a cigarette? cannot even imagine being without a cigarette. Hmm. You can't even imagine it? No. Truthful. Mm. When you think about your life without cigarettes, it's just a big blank. Yeah, it's just bizarre. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's one thing. Like. Yeah, that's one thing. That's, but that's, it's like jumping off the edge of a cliff and you can't even see where you're going. Very true. Yeah. Then the second part of it, of course, I think, without a question, is that fear of what you're going to go through when you quit, that withdrawal of that nicotine. And you're that's, worried about that. Sure, you're, you're worried about that. And, and you've heard people say, oh, my God, the first 10 days are just disgusting. And you will be crazy. And you'll go nuts. And you hear this. You go, I don't want to go through this. You don't want to be crazy for no, 10 days. I don't want to be crazy for 10 days. I'll just smoke. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're dealing with. You have to. There's, there's, a, there's a physical part of that and then there's a mental part and so mm -hmm. both of those have got to mesh I think at the same time mm -hmm. where you finally say okay I don't care if I go through 10 days I gotta quit and I think when that finally those two that's for me anyway when those two roads collide or when those two roads intersect each other I think that's when you're finally able to make that choice and how is that gonna happen for you I think constantly reinforcing in your mind that you want to quit. I think, you know, constantly saying to yourself, dude, this is going to be a pain. Or is that maybe it could be just that one time when you were sneaking out of the house on a cold winter night uh, at 1130 with ice on the road and you're driving to go get a pack of cigarettes. You, you, you finally go, wait a minute, this is insane. Mm. This is really insane. Well, I get the feeling that it's coming for you. It is. It's on I, the way. Right, it is on the way because it, it's time. You just know somehow. It's time right now. It's time. And you know. And you know it's time, and the body's saying it's time, and the mind is saying it. That's why I say I think the two roads have to intersect, and when they do, you'll, you'll do it. And when you look ahead, right, if you look ahead, say, a year, do you see those two ro roads coming together? I think I see it sooner than a year. Hmm. I think I see it sooner. Even sooner? Yes. I think there comes a time when you just have to, you just finally say, well, I just gave you the reasons why it's so yeah. bad to smoke. Yeah. So if you're constantly reinforcing that in your mind, and you're remembering it every time, um, then eventually you'll say, you know what, I think I've convinced myself. And is that how it will happen for you, that you'll wake up one day and you'll say, that's it, I'm, I'm ready, I'm done? 
I think that's the way it'll happen. I think, you know, and like I said, it, it, it should have happened when you're, when it's January and the snow on the ground and you're driving 11 o'clock to get a pack of cigarettes. That should have been the time. Mm -hmm. But it's the insanity of it because of that addiction. And it is an addiction. Mm -hmm. And it is the insanity that you don't want to go through that withdrawal. And, and at the same time, you, you don't, can't imagine yourself without it. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, you have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I wonder what things you've thought of to make yourself successful once that decision comes to you, okay, now I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm going to stop there. It goes on for another 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> and, and again, you can get that interview and watch it yourself if you wish. As she's saying, what have you thought about to, to make yourself successful? She's making a transition into the planning process even to begin to think about, well, how, how could you do this? Um, and I wanted to focus really on the evoking process that you've been seeing happening in just 10 minutes. Uh, someone who came in not planning to talk about smoking, not seeking any help with regard to smoking, is suddenly talking a lot about why he would, why he would quit smoking. So what's going on inside this interview? Uh, and that's why I've chosen this one uh, to look closely at, because it's such a good example of the way evoking works. So he starts off saying, if I could have a cigarette right now, I would. I mean, that, it's that urgent. And indeed, he was leaving the studio and going out and smoking, coming back, going out and smoking, coming back. So this is a, this is a constant thing for him. And she says, it's that much a part of your life that you feel like you would have one even right now. A simple reflection. Well, complex reflection, actually. She's kind of broadening out to say it's part of your life. Okay? Absolutely, he says. And I think you find yourself going out at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night to go to the store to grab a pack of cigarettes when you smoke because it's what you need, physically need it. But you also like it because you enjoy it. So you, you hear the ambivalence in there. Now, there's nothing in there that we would yet call change talk. And yet it's right underneath the surface. He's, he's already talking about the inconvenience of running out to get cigarettes and so forth. And she, and she hears that. But her reflection is right. There's a part of you that really enjoys smoking. Now that I think is a brilliant little reflection because the logical next thing to say is the other part. You know? She says, there's a part of you that really enjoys smoking. And she is indeed reflecting what he just said, you know, you enjoy it. You know? But she's inviting him to look at the other side as well in a simple reflection. Right, he says. Now, what I put in green is change talk. And then there's a part that says you really don't want to, or you shouldn't. It has nothing to do with people saying you can. It's the fact that after a period of time, you start, the flavor, the taste, the problems become an issue. Now, he's using the word you to talk about himself. And some people have watched this. Uh, it, that bothers them. They would want to try to make him say I instead of you. Didn't bother me. I, I know he's talking about himself. That's, uh, that's pretty clear. Harry's response. Mm. On the one hand, you really like it. And it's good for you. Helps you. And on the other hand, you're noticing some things that you don't like about it. Like you have to go out at night and get it. You have to look for a break. And then there's also something about the flavor and the taste, you said. So she's been listening very carefully for anything that sounds like change talk in what he's saying. And she's put it together in this little summary already. We talked about when you, when you have just a few elements of change talk, try putting them together in a, in a little bouquet and offer them back. And that's what she's doing. And notice she also, this is a double-sided reflection. She starts with, on the one hand, you really like it. So she's acknowledging that. 
And then on the other hand, and now she's giving him his change talk. And in a double-sided reflection, whatever you say last is the thing the person is most likely to respond to. Okay? So she has, she has put the change talk last in this double-sided summary. Yeah, he says, you just get to the point where it's not enjoyable anymore. You're just doing it strictly out of habit, probably because of the nicotine that you want. But it's really not because you want it. It's because it gets to a point where you have to have it. So all of that is, is change talk. And then he says, and I've never tried to quit. I mean, I've been smoking for a long time, and I never once said, you know what? I'm going to quit smoking. And you can hear in there, he's thinking about it, you know? And, and why is that, you think? Now, that's an open question. The, the expected answer, because she, she's asking, why haven't you quit? The expected answer to that is sustained talk. So you might think, why, well, why would you ask that question? You know? Now, remember, we're just a few minutes into the interview here. So in a way, are we still engaging? Is, it, is this still kind of answering this question? Can we take a walk together? You know, is, it, is it safe to have a conversation here? Or should we be more into engaging, or into evoking at this point? Uh, so th this is the question to keep exploring the other side for him, even though as you move into the evoking process, you're going to want to differentially favor change talk. But literally, the answer to this open question would be sustained talk. So let's see if that's what happens. Yes, it is. I think it becomes so much a part of your life. It becomes what you do. It's everything that you are. If you go fishing, you go hunting, you go sporting events, everything you do, that cigarette becomes part of who you are even to a point where you can't imagine yourself looking in a mirror without holding a cigarette. It is part of you, part of who your character is even. Right? So he's, she's learning more about the, you know, the, the sustained talk side of things. So cigarettes, she says, are now a part of your character. And, and by the way, reflections can be shorter and often should be shorter than what the person just said. You're picking out some particular little crystal, little jewel in there. And, and here she's just kind of summary, summarizing what he said in a very simple reflection. So cigarettes are now a part of your character. Absolutely. So when you reflect sustained talk, normally you would expect more sustained talk. And that's what happens. Absolutely, it becomes part of your character. I've had people tell me they can't even imagine me without a cigarette. Can't imagine what I'd look like without a cigarette. To which she reflects, and you can't even imagine yourself without a cigarette. No, so you just, it becomes who you are. Oh, but now look what happens. And now he begins offering change talk. You know? But at the same time, you know some things are happening. One is you know that the taste isn't there anymore. So he's just not enjoying the taste anymore. The cost is getting really, really high. So now you're finding yourself going to these lesser brands or making this run to the res. The, the res is the Native American reservation uh, located nearby. And they can sell cigarettes without taxes, without federal taxes. So you can get cigarettes more cheaply there. So. Now he's driving 40 miles up the road to, to buy a, a less expensive brand of cigarettes. I mean, you have to do so much to smoke a cigarette and to maintain that desire that it gets really ridiculous, quite frankly. Fair amount of change talk. Smoking used to be carefree for you, she says, but now it's actually causing you a lot of trouble. Very simple, double-sided reflection putting sustained talk or look to the past really first, and now some change talk as the, as the conclusion. And you might expect more change talk, and there it is. It's a challenge now. It's not just go get a pack of cigarettes. It's now how much do they cost? Which ones are the cheaper ones? 
Do you pick up a carton at the reservation because it's so much cheaper with no taxes? Did you burn a hole in your clothes? Oh my God, that shirt, I burned a hole. I mean, you start running into more and more issues. Then you start wondering, what's the return of this? What is the value? It's a large chunk of change talk. Now, this is not happening accidentally. You know? This is happening because of Dr. Moyer's skill in, uh, in motivational interviewing. You're smoking more and enjoying it less. And not only that, but then here comes all these sort of burdens or costs. Now, there's a reference in here that, that you probably don't recognize, but there used to be a, a cigarette commercial that said, smoke less and enjoy it more. Use this brand of, of cigarettes. You know. She doesn't know if, if he remembers it, but probably he does. You know. But that's her reference here. But she turns it around and says, now you're smoking more and enjoying it less. And then here are all these burdens and costs of, of the smoking as well. So a nice, tight, reflective response to his change talk. What happens next? I would be a terrible smoke commercial. He does remember, you know, a terrible commercial. It's almost like if you were trying to convince yourself to smoke, you would have a hard time doing it. It'd be like the old saying, smoke less and enjoy more. That was the, that was the commercial on American television. But it's just the opposite. Smoke more and enjoy less. So it would be a terrible advertising campaign. You just get to the point where you finally decide for yourself, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, in the back of your mind, somewhere in the back of your mind, you're saying, you know, there's going to come a time when I'm going to put these down. Really, the first time in talking about quitting, you're thinking about it, she says. Nice, lovely, short, simple reflection. You're thinking about it. Absolutely. Because of the involvement, how much its involvement is to smoke. It's too much. You have to. There's the physical part of that, and then there's the mental part. So both of these have got to mesh at the same time before you finally say, okay, I don't care if I have to go through 10 days, I've got to quit. <clears throat> and I think that when finally those two, for me anyway, those two roads collide, <clears throat> or when those two roads intersect with each other, I think that's when you're finally going to you're finally able to make that choice. So I was actually thinking ahead a little bit. We call it envisioning. It's is imagining making the decision to quit. Again, a, a nice, simple response. This one, an open question. How is that going to happen for you? So she's inviting him to imagine a little more what it would be like to quit smoking. And he does. I think constantly reinforcing in your mind that you want to quit. I think, you know, constantly saying to yourself, gee, this is getting to be a pain. Or maybe it could be just that one time when you're sneaking out of the house on a cold winter night at 1130 with ice on the road. <laughs> Obviously, this has happened to him, including burning the holes in his clothes and so forth. And you're driving to go get a pack of cigarettes. You finally go, wait a minute. This is insane. This is really insane. Well, she says, I get the feeling that it's coming for you. Now, that's continuing the paragraph. That's taking what he said even a little bit further. Let's see if he goes with that. I feel like, I feel like this is coming for you. It is, he says. It's on the way. Nice, simple reflection. Right, it's on the way because it's time. You just know somehow. It's time right now. She's pushing a little bit. Uh -huh. It's time, he says. Uh -huh. And you know, and you know it's time. And the body is saying it's time. And the mind is saying it. That's why I say I think the two roads have to intersect. And when they do, you'll do it. They say, Still putting it off a little bit, but he's definitely reflecting on this. And when you look ahead, right? If you look ahead, say a year, giving him some room, you know, do you see those two roads coming together? I think I see it sooner than a year. 
I think I see it sooner, even sooner, she said. Yes, I think there comes a time when you just have to finally say, well, I just gave you all the reasons why it's so bad to smoke. You know? He's aware of having been talking about this. And by the way, later in this interview, uh, after, after Dr. Morris was done, I sat down with him on camera and said, now, tell me about this conversation. What was this like for you? And you can see that part if you want to. And he says something like, you know, when you when you just hear yourself say these things out loud, it makes it real. It's it, it's powerful. You know, so so he's hearing himself. And that's an important piece of what's going on in motivational interviewing. The person hears him or herself making the arguments for change rather than you, the counselor, making the arguments for change. Now, all of that happened in less than 10 minutes. And as I, as I pointed out, she then went on to um, uh, explore planning, how he might do it, or she did the importance and confidence rulers that we talked about on a zero to 10 scale. Um, I think she said on a one to 10 scale, you know, it doesn't matter, but, but to, where are you now? Why are you there at five and not at zero? So you'd see some more examples of the, uh, of the process. But I think even that much, even those 10 minutes, are such a good example of how you're always thinking ahead a step. And fortunately, you don't have to think ahead 10 steps like you do in chess. You know, it's just, if I say this, what's the next thing the client is likely to say? And, and that's what is going on inside this interview. <clears throat> now, we also talked last time about summaries. Uh, and you saw some small summaries here in what she was doing. But I wonder, I thought about, well, if you were to give a summary for his 20 minutes of interview, what would that look like? And it really matters what you put into a summary uh, and, and how you're thinking about it. What, what would guide you in summarizing the things that he said? So I've got four examples of possible summaries to this very interview. Here's the first one. You've shared a lot with me regarding how you feel about smoking. Sometimes you think it's crazy how much trouble you go through just to get cigarettes. You've heard horror stories about how bad nicotine withdrawal can be, and you feel antsy just thinking about it even right now. It annoys you when people are rude and critical of you for smoking, and you're clear that nobody can make you quit. You don't like the idea of taking a medication to help. That came later in the interview. And when you consider what your life would be without cigarettes, it's just a blank. You can't even imagine it. Now, from a person-centered perspective, that's a perfectly good summary of what the person said. What's guiding you when you're deciding what to put into a summary? That's important to consider. And what seems to be guiding this summary is emotion. Is, is you know, when he was expressing with some affect with some feeling what was going on. And she just, you know, the, the summarizer would just pull those things together. And indeed, that was one thing I was told when I was learning a person-centered, client-centered approach. Well, always listen for the feelings and, and reflect those and, and put those into a summary. If you do that with this guy, where is he at the end of this summary? Uh, he hasn't really moved much. I mean, he's just thinking about how hard it would be to quit or the, you know, he's just kind of feeling the emotion of it, but it doesn't move him. This, this kind of summary doesn't get him, doesn't get him going. So that's an affect or an emotion focused summary. Here's a different possible summary. Sound like smoking doesn't do much for you anymore although you still prefer it. There's all the social stigma, the cost, the hassles, maybe even damage to your health. You're smoking more and enjoying it less. On the other hand, it's a normal part of your whole life, your character, so much so that you can't even imagine yourself as a non-smoker and you've never tried to quit. You don't want to take medication and you're worried how bad, how crazy withdrawal would be. In fact, living without smoking would feel pretty crazy. Those are all things he said. 
So again, from, from just a straight person-centered perspective, perfectly good summary, but not a good summary from a motivational interviewing perspective. It's kind of double-sided. It's got both things in it. However, the, the change talk is at the beginning. The social stigma, the cost, the hassles, the damage to your health, smoking lower, more, enjoying it less. And then the other side, the sustained talk. And if you give the sustained talk second, what's he going to talk about? He's going to talk about how crazy it would feel to not be smoking, how he doesn't want to take medication. I mean, so he's, he'll be responding to the most recent thing that's in the summary. So you see some of the art even involved in holding together what a, what a client has said to you. This, this would leave him giving you more sustained talk. That would be the expected effect of this summary, double-sided summary, and unfortunately, backwards. Now, if you gave the same summary, smoking is a normal part of your, of your whole life, your character, you can't imagine yourself without it. You don't want to take medication. You're worried how bad it'll be. In fact, living without smoking, you feel pretty crazy. And on the other hand, smoking doesn't do much for you anymore. And there's all the social stigma, the cost, the hassles maybe even damage to your health. You're smoking more and enjoying it less. If you give the summary that way, he'd probably be talking more about change talk. Summary number three. Clearly you're seeing plenty of downsides to your smoking. You don't really enjoy it anymore. It's just become an expensive bad habit. And then there's the social stigma. It's harder to smoke anymore, and even the flavor, the taste is gone. You know it's starting to affect your health, so you're asking yourself what the return is for all these costs. And th these are all his words. You know? You're even beginning to look at the benefits of quitting. The money and hassles that you'd save, maybe your food would taste better. You're getting ready and said you're already halfway there. That was a little later in the interview. Uh, and, uh, and it's time. And you know you're going to quit. Now, that's a classic motivational interviewing summary. What, what that one does is pull together almost all of the change talk threads that were in there, kind of weaving them together and offering them together as a summary. And it, it's quite powerful for people when this happens sometimes, because they've been hearing themselves say these things, but now they hear you pulling them all together. And that's something that's a little harder to do on your own. It's something that, that a motivational interview can do, can do with you and for you. Uh, but as soon as you alone begin thinking of all the change talk, you tend to then flip and think of the other side. So as I said last time in the forest analogy, motivational interviewing helps you stay in a straight line to go from tree to tree to tree. You keep listening to sustained talk and you don't ignore it. And you can even include it in a summary if you want to, but, but put it early. But it, it really makes a difference what you put into a summary like this. But suppose you did want to include some of this sustained talk in your summary. Well, then what might it sound like? Get a little bit longer, but... Smoking has become a normal part of your whole life so that it's difficult even to imagine yourself as a non-smoker. You don't like taking medication. You're worried how bad nicotine withdrawal would be. But at the same time, now the word but, there's, there's your turning point, you know. And it could be and, by the way. And at the same time, you're clearly seeing all these downsides of your smoking. You don't really enjoy it anymore. It's just become an expensive bad habit and there's the social stigma. It's harder to smoke anymore, and even the flavor, the taste is gone. You're aware it's starting to affect your health. So you're asking yourself what the return is for all these costs. You've even been thinking about the benefits of quitting, the, the money and hassles you'd save, and maybe that food would taste better. You've been getting ready, and you said you're already halfway there, that it's time, and you know you're going to quit. And how you give a summary like that is important. This is, this is not the prosecuting attorney's summary. Uh, this is not 
trying to persuade the person, you're not, not you're trying to trick them into changing. You're just with good understanding, saying back what the person has said to you in a particular way that's likely to evoke change talk and actually likely to evoke change as well. So I, I hope in that analysis, you begin to see some of the inner workings of, uh, of motivational interviewing and how you're thinking when you're doing this, what, how, you, how you're planning what to say next and thinking one step ahead. Well, I could say this, if I say this, what's the person gonna say next? Or I could say this, if I say this, what's the person gonna say next? And doing that quickly, you know, and that takes some practice over time. You just get better at it over time. And then when you've given a summary like that, what do you, what do you say next? Well, one thing you can do is just wait in silence. Just kind of let the summary sink in and wait for the person to say whatever they're going to say next. Or you could ask, what else? Or, you know, have I missed anything? Or something like that. Maybe to hear some more change talk. Or in our, in our very first edition, we suggested something called we call the key question. The essence of which is, so what's next? You know? So having given a summary like that, you can ask a key question. So what are you thinking at this point? And then wait. You know? Or what do you make of all this? Or what, is, what are you considering? What would you be willing to do? What, what might you do? What, what could you do? What do you plan to do? The, the words you use matter. You know? And some of them will work better with certain clients than with others. But essentially, you've pulled together the person's change talk. And then you're asking again, so what do you what do you think about all this? And listen to what they have to say. So now I want to do a practice. This is this is the most complex practice we've done so far. Yeah. We're going to be in groups of 12 plus a facilitator. So the, there will be a facilitator for each of the groups. We'll take 30 minutes, so it'll take a, take a fair amount of time to, uh, to try this out. And one member of the group will be a speaker, will volunteer to be a speaker. And it's the topic that we've been using in the last couple of sessions, a change or an opportunity that I want or I hope to pursue. You know? So you can be thinking about that, that in your group, if you were to be the speaker, what's something that you're thinking about doing? An opportunity or some change you're thinking about making? Haven't done it yet, uh, but you'd have a conversation about that. You know? Another member of the group will volunteer to interview the speaker for 10 minutes. And that's, that's it, just 10 minutes. Trying out some of the MI methods that we've been covering here. You know? So they'll, they'll have a conversation about the change the person is thinking about making or the opportunity they're thinking about pursuing. And everybody else in the group, which will be about 10 people, um, you're observers. And I want you to take notes and I'll give you a little more instruction about what notes to take. So the interviewer's job you just ask the speaker, what is it you're thinking about doing? You know? Then you can ask open questions to invite change talk. And I think maybe I've got those. No, I don't. They were on a previous slide. So if you want to ask desire questions, what, what do you hope will happen? You know, why would you want to do this? What is it you want to happen? So how would you like things to be different? Want, like, hope, wish. Those are the words that are inviting desire talk. Or you can ask about ability. Well, how might you do this if you decide to go about it? Or you could use a scaling question. You know? How confident are you on a scale from zero to 10 that if you did decide to do this, you could succeed? What do you think? Zero, not at all? 10, you're completely sure. What number would you give yourself? 
And then remember the next question is, and why that number and not zero? Because the answer to that has changed a lot. You could ask for reasons. What are some good reasons for you to, to do this? What would you see as the, the advantages of doing this? What might be the best thing that would happen if you did this? You can ask about need, often using importance language. And again, you can use a, a zero to 10 scale if you want. On a zero to 10 scale, how important would you say it is for you to do this? Zero is not at all important. 10 is, this is the most important thing in my life right now. What number would you give yourself? And then when you hear the number, the next question is four. Okay, and why four and not zero? Because the answer to that is change talk. Activation language has words like willing, considering, thinking about. So what are you thinking about doing? Yeah. What are you considering? What would you be willing to do? You know, taking steps. What Are there things you've already done that kind of are a step in this direction? What things have you done that, that kind of are a head start here? And then commitment questions are almost the last ones you would ask, but so what, what do you think you'll do? So you see the range of questions you can ask that, that invite change talk. You just ask one of those questions and then listen really well. If you feel the urge to give advice, don't do it. <laughs> if you feel the urge to tell the person why it's important to do this, don't do it. You know, you're holding back your own arguments for change to invite the person to tell you what's important about it, why they want to do it, how they would do it, and so on. Then when you hear change talk, reflect it or, or affirm it. Just kind of respond to it in a way that invites some more change talk. Or you could ask another, a further question also. What, what would be good about that? What would be different? Now you're collecting the flowers. So you're hearing change talk and you kind of putting these, these together and maybe you'll give a reflection that puts together two or three change talk themes that you heard, that'd be okay. And at, at the end of 10 minutes, you're done. The interviewer's finished. You don't have to give the big summary right? because that's the observer's job. The observers, the rest of you during this 10 minutes are paying close attention to the interview Watch, um, then, okay, I think, I, I think um, well, what you're watching actually for is observer skill, is uh, interviewer skills. So what did you see the interviewer doing that's a good example of MI skillfulness? What did you see? And just write down these examples as you go through. Make written notes for yourself. Now, you can do this one several ways. I was, I was initially thinking you'd be writing down change talk, but that's not what I want you to do. I want you to write down every example you hear of something that's consistent with motivational interviewing. That was a good open question that I heard there. Or the, you reflected the change talk that the person gave you. I heard that, you know. Or I, I like the tone of your voice. It, it was very gentle, very inviting, you know. Uh, I liked how you were paying such close attention and keeping good eye contact with the person. Well, you can't see that on a, on a video. In person, that's the kind of thing we do. And then be ready. If you were to make one suggestion to this interviewer about something they could try that might help them increase their skills in motivational interviewing, what would you suggest? So each observer is also responsible to be thinking about that. What, what could you suggest, just one thing, to try next? After the, at the end of 10 minutes, the, uh, the facilitator is going to time this and say, okay, that's 10 minutes, it's up. And you don't have to do a summary there. You're just done wherever you were in the interview. You just finished at the end of 10 minutes. 
now the facilitators are going to call on the other people to state one good thing they saw that the interviewer did. What was one am I consistent response that you heard? And only one. No criticisms. No nothing. No suggestions here. Yeah, not that. I think you could have done this. No, 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 none of that. Just I, I, I saw this question. I thought that was good. I like the way you reflected that. I like this about what you're doing. And say you be talking to the interviewer because what you're doing is telling the interviewer what you saw them doing well. And every person tries to offer a new observation, something different from what was already said. It's okay to kind of echo something a person said before, but try to add a new piece from the notes that you took. So take good notes, observe closely. And everybody, every observer is gonna get a chance to uh, offer uh, that kind of feedback. Right? And, and by the way, when everybody's had a chance, you could, the, the facilitator can also say anything else and anything else that was on your list that didn't get said, say it. So if everything that you observed that, uh, that was a good example of MI, tell the interviewer about it. That's your, that's your job. When that's done, then somebody's going to make one recommendation. And I ask each facilitator to either have physical dice available or easier. There are all kinds of apps on your phone that you can use that will roll dice for you. you know. So everybody got a number, as I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, and then the facilitator will roll the dice and somebody's number comes up. And if it's your number as an observer, it's your job to make one gentle suggestion of something the interviewer could try to strengthen motivational interviewing skills. And by the way, the interviewer's number might come up, in which case you would say, well, one thing I might try next. Or the person who was the speaker, their number might come up and they could make a suggestion. And only one person gets to do it. Only the person whose number comes up. So facilitators, now just as a reminder, first of all, have a be, be ready to come up with a number, whether you've got dice or an app on your phone or whatever it is, um, number from one to 12. And then before you get started on the interview, assign everybody a number. And don't, don't ask people to count off because that's crazy to try to do that on the screen. So just say, uh, Oh, okay, uh, Roshni, your number is and one. And so everybody's got a number. Remember your number because it may come up later on. Uh, if you know how to change the name on your screen, put your number in there, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, so it's everybody can even see it. But at least the facility is going to remember who's got what number. Right? Help the group decide quickly who's going to be the speaker and who's going to be the interviewer. And then when you got that and say, okay, time to start and keep track and, and let the interview go, let the interview run for 10 minutes. When 10 minutes are done, the interview is over no matter where it was, just stop right there. And now you start the affirmation round and ask every person who was an observer to say one thing they saw that was mo good motivational interviewing from their perspective. And then finally, facilitator, you roll the dice or put your, push your app or whatever you're going to do to come up with a number of one participant. And that person will give one recommendation. And that's the end of this round. Here in Albuquerque, we've had a group like this run for years. You know, we come together and, and practice, you know, maybe two or three people would do a 10 minute practice. And then we take the time for the observers to say, here's what I saw that I thought was skillful am I. So you get lots of positive feedback and then somebody makes one suggestion and that's the end of the round. You know? uh, and that, that's that been fun enough that people just keep coming back to do this. If you work in an agency where you're trying to help people learn motivational interviewing, here's a format that you can use uh, just to practice the skills, to do deliberate practice of MI skills. 